Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're just going to take a moment for people to get into the session and then we'll run through some information and some quick intros before we begin. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of your evening, whether you're already home or just leaving work or at work. We really appreciate you joining the session. We hope that it's informative to you. Um, and we are gonna spend a lot of time running through um, a lot of questions this evening, but um, anything that we don't cover or you want to ask us um, outside of this event via email, please don't hesitate to reach out. So I'm just gonna check to see, we've got some attendees, so wonderful. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself and then we'll just get started. Um, but thank you for joining again. We're happy to uh, be discussing um, applying to our Doctor of Nursing Practice and Nurse Anesthesia program. I'm joined by my colleague who will introduce herself in just a moment, but um, my name is Elise Murphy and I'm the Assistant Director of Recruitment for UNE's Westbrook College of Health Professions. Um, our WCHP um, has a variety of different undergraduate and graduate programs. I'm getting ahead of myself because we'll talk about this in a couple of slides, but one of them is our, our DNP program. So um, I'm joined tonight by my colleague in the Office of Graduate Missions, who's going to spend a lot of time talking to you um, and sharing some helpful information. So Laura, would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Absolutely. So my name is Laura Noyes. I'm one of the admissions coordinators here in our Office of Graduate Admissions in the Portland campus uh, for the Westbrook College of Health Professions. I've been working with the nurse anesthesia program for about three years now. So I'm really excited to talk with all of you and answer any questions that you may have. Excellent. All right. So tonight's format, we are going to run through some important dates for uh, this current cycle because the cycle did just open last week. So I want to share just a caveat. It's a helpful piece if you're applying to our program in future cycles. Please use this as a guide and some baseline information, but no requirements could change. So if you are considering applying in a future cycle, we always recommend that you reach out. But I think tonight we'll, we'll cover a lot of really helpful information that will prepare you even to apply for future cycles. But just wanna share that as a reminder. Um, we will review some of our admissions requirements. Laura's gonna provide some helpful recommendations. And we really wanna spend the majority of tonight's session running through the questions that you've submitted via the registration form. We also have a list of questions that we've put together on our own. So we may do a, a bit of a rapid fire towards the end just to make sure that you're getting all the information that you need. Um, before we dive into the presentation, I do wanna just remind everyone that we are recording the session. So if you're able to stick with us throughout the whole event, you will be able to come back and review this information. But if you do need to step away, uh, we will share this recording with you within the next two days. It just takes a, a day to upload and for us to just get the communication scheduled, but you'll have it by the end of this week. And um, for anyone who is watching the recording, this is talking to the future attendees, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions, but we hope that we'll cover a good portion of them. And um, the Q&A um, Q feature is live for this event. We're going to hold all questions till the end of the presentation, and then we'll answer them and just go through them. So as Laura is walking through some information, feel free to put them in the Q&A, and then we'll come back to them in, um, in a couple minutes. So just to start off with a little information about UNE tonight, we're really here to talk about our admissions process for our DNP program. But just want to get you a little familiar with UNE and its its community. So we're proud to say we're the number one provider for health professionals in the state of Maine. Um, we are committed to educating health leaders who make a difference for their patients and the communities that they live in. We have over 12 gra graduate and doctoral health related programs, of course, including nurse anesthesia, but we also have a College of Osteopathic Medicine, a College of Dental Medicine, PA program, and what's really exciting is there's a lot of opportunities to collaborate and get to know and work alongside um, these other training students um, in their respective health professions. So as you continue to get to know UNE, 
um, and talk with some of our faculty and students. Um, you'll, you'll understand a large emphasis on interprofessional education. So uh, we do have three campuses, two being in Maine. Just want to um, share that the DNP program and Laura is actually going to give you a little bit of a program timeline in terms of what does the DNP um, curriculum look like in just a moment. But um, you'd be based in our Portland campus. And uh, we do have a Biddeford campus, which is about half hour south of Portland. And we're in southern Maine. Um, so here's just a quick look at our Biddeford campus. This is where we have our undergraduate um, programs, as well as our College of Osteopathic Medicine. But in about two years time, the College of Osteopathic Medicine is going to join us on the Portland campus, which is really exciting. So we'll really truly have all of our graduate health related programs on the same campus. But as a UNE student, you have access to the Biddeford campus. So here um, we have gym facilities, a library, there's a private beach on campus. So depending on where you're living, um, which Laura will get into when you're you know, going to be working on campus versus off, you do have access to this campus. And here's a quick look at our Portland campus where we have, again, all of our graduate health related programs outside of the College for Osteopathic Medicine for right now. Um, but it's a great graduate focused campus. And what's nice is there's a lot of student services um, on this campus for our graduate students. So you don't have to compete with the resources um, and compete with undergraduate students. We have our own tutoring center, access center, counseling services, and so on. So just want to give you a little heads up about our Portland campus. Um, and of course, if you're not um, from Maine, um, we're in Portland, but you have access to um, the city of Portland, which is a great um, little city that has um, really, you know, wonderful restaurants, different activities, art um, venues and museums and concert halls. So um, we, we know, of course, that you're going to be focused primarily on getting through the program, but the city of Portland and life in Maine may provide you some balance in getting through it. You know, of course, uh, we're in summertime, so um, going to the beach is when you can fit that time in and when the weather's right is a given. I guess even not on the sunniest of days, it's really beautiful to explore um, the beaches, mountains, hiking trails all year round. So again, um, you can have a bit of a balanced life in Maine and as you're going through the program. But maybe not take my word from it, you might wanna talk with our students too about how they balance it out. And in a couple of slides, I'll come back to some talking about some opportunities to come meet some of our students in the next couple of weeks. And we will talk about some additional opportunities virtually because we know that you're all working right now for you to learn more about our DNP program. So Laura, I set you up with just a little bit of information. I think now we can dive into the meat of why we're meeting tonight. But um, as you would like me to advance the slide, please just let me know and I will we'll do that for you. Awesome. Thanks, Elise. So as you can see here, you know, we've got some really great things that are going on with our DNP program. So we were accredited as a DNP program for the first time um, for 2022, for 21, 22, for the students coming into 2022. Um, and we received the maximum 10 year accreditation from the Council on Accreditation. And prior to that, we've been receiving the maximum 10 year accreditation for several rounds now. So we are a well established program. We've been around for a while. We have great success. Our students have great success out in the field. You know, our students are typically employed six to nine months before they even finish their program. So it's really exciting around here. You know, we have jobs calling us saying, hey, when are you graduating students? Do you know anyone? Do you have anyone? And, you know, our students are super stoked about that. And sometimes it's, you know, they get into a little bit of a bidding war, which is fun for the, the students too. Um, so we offer a wide variety of clinical placements from, you know, large scale, you know, level one hospitals to, you know, smaller, very niche sites uh, that include, you know, 
reconstructive surgery or um, plastic surgery. We've got a site in Washington, D.C. that does that. We've got small rural sites up in northern Maine and New Hampshire. Uh, we've got, you know, again, these large sites at Maine Med or uh, UVM is another popular one for our students. So we really do offer a wide range of opportunities for these students who are coming into our program. Uh, with our DMP program, one of the other great things is that for the first two semesters, our students are fully hybrid, which means they're only coming to campus for two to three days each semester. So that means our students start in the fall and they'll come to campus for orientation and you know, usually a day or two after orientation to get settled, meet their professors, all of those activities. And then they don't come back to campus until late March. And again, they're here for you know two or three days and then they're back home until they come and start full-time in the spring in you know end of May, beginning of June. So you can go ahead to the next slide, Elise. So for our requirements for our DMP program, we require that you have your nursing degree. Now, people always ask, you know, if I have a associates in nursing, is that okay? Yes. So what we are looking for is that you have to have a nursing degree. And, you know, if it's an associates in nursing, it needs to be an associates in nursing and some kind of bachelor in a science field. So that means chemistry, biology, uh, you know, anatomy, those kinds of, you know, engineering is another one that oddly comes up. Um, so we're really looking for someone who's got, you know, a really strong science background. A lot of people also just do their bachelor's in nursing, and that is totally okay, too. We see a wide variety of applicants every year, um, and their educational backgrounds, you know, are kind of all over the place, which is kind of fun, honestly. It brings a lot of different perspectives into the program. Uh, we require that you have a current RN license in good standing wherever you're located. So if you're located here in the state of Maine, you need a good a one that's in good standing in the state of Maine. If you are in Hawaii, like we have students this year who will be coming from Hawaii, they need to have their RN licenses who, that are in good standing in the state of Hawaii. Uh, at the time of application, we require a minimum of 18 months experience in a critical care setting. Now, our current incoming class has an average of about 41 months of critical care experience. So, you know, while the minimum is 18 months, you know, we really, you know, we want to have students who are very much aware and confident and capable in their practices because some of that stuff is foundational to what you will be doing in a CRNA program. We require copies of, you know, any certifications, score reports, your, so your ACLS and your PALS, um, the incoming class, everyone had either their CCRN, their CEN, or their trauma nursing certificate. So keep those in mind too, just because, you know, you have your ACLS and PALS and these other pieces, it might, you know, you might not be as competitive as others. Uh, your official transcripts need to be submitted directly to nursing CAS. You know, if you send them to me, that's great, but I'm just going to send you an email saying, sorry, send them again, send them elsewhere. And, you know, that's for some people a waste of money sending them over to me. Others, you know, it really depends on the school that you're going to. Some schools will charge, some schools won't, but just send them to nursing casts. Don't send them over to me directly. Um, we need proof that you have completed biochemistry at that 300 level. And I think we'll cover this a little more in depth later on. Um, but those grades need to be sent to nursing CAS no later than the final application deadline for the cycle that you're applying for, which for this year is February 15th, 2024. We require three letters of recommendation, and one of those must come from a nurse manager or supervisor. And people always ask, well, can I have this person? No, I need, we need to have one from your nurse manager or supervisor. If we do not have that, we will not move your application forward. And then the last piece that we ask everyone to upload is a copy of their resume. And we need what we're looking for on that resume is just, you know, an overview of what you do, what your skill set is, and you know, how many months and you know, what was the month and year that you started in your current, you know, critical care experiences or prior experiences that you might be, you know, wanting to count towards that. And you can go ahead and next, thanks. So like I said, you know, 
and like Elise said, the application is currently open. The portal opened on August 10th, 2023, and we will be accepting applications through February 15th, 2024 for this current cycle. And that will be for students starting in September of 2024. Those apps do need to go directly through nursing cast. They need to be, you know, fully verified by nursing cast, which means that, you know, all materials have to be submitted, uploaded. It's kind of, I like to call it a mini background check because they're making sure that you kind of have everything there and that you're being honest and truthful in that. So we, I refer to it as mini background check. If you haven't passed that, we're not going to consider you for, you know, can invite to interview or for, you know, consideration for acceptance. You can go ahead and thank you, Elise. <laughs> You're ahead of me on that one. Um, so for requirements for this program, we recommend a overall GPA of a 3.0 as calculated by nursing cast. So nursing cast, there should be a page on there where um, they do some, they walk you through how to do your GPA calculation. So you can get a good idea. Um, if you don't have that 3.0 GPA, it really is going to depend on what you've been doing in the meantime. So, you know, we have students in the program that we ha that have below an, a 3.0 GPA. But when we are looking at what they've done maybe over their last 60 credits or what they've done since they graduated from their undergrad, those GPAs are significantly higher. So just kind of think those pieces through if maybe you have below a 3.0 from your undergrad but you know you did a you know you did a master's degree or you've done an additional five classes worth of co coursework and you've gotten A's and all of that. That's really great and that makes us happy to see and we're going to take that into consideration more heavily than your overall GPA from undergrad. So just think those pieces through as well. Uh, we do have some preferred science classes that we really do look at when we are considering these GPAs. Uh, there's a really great list there on the screen for you. Um, and, you know, we know that not everyone has these classes, but if, if applicants are looking for a good way to strengthen their application or strengthen their academic history, that's kind of a really great place to start that we recommend. Um, and, you know, always as a reminder, just because you've got, you know, everything that was on the last slide and everything here, it doesn't guarantee that you will qualify for an interview or qualify for acceptance. You know, we tend to get, you know, about 70 applicants a year. So, you know, we try to interview anyone who is qualified, but again, that, you know, you need to meet all of these criteria. So the biochemistry piece, this is the one piece that I probably get the most number of questions about. Um, so our biochemistry course does need to be a minimum of three semester credits. It needs to be an upper division course. So 300 level or above, or if it makes it easier for you to wrap your head around, junior standing or higher, which is why community college courses aren't accepted. Uh, you need to receive a grade of a B or better. I We can't accept a B minus, you know, unfortunately it needs to be a B or better. And that comes down to the accrediting body, we were able to cut out a biochemistry course at the graduate level. So, you know, we're trying to save you time and energy and effort as is a part of the grad program. So we require this because we're not going to be teaching it in the DNP program itself, which is also why it needs to be completed no more than five years prior to the application deadline and why those grades really do need to be submitted directly to nursing CAS no later than the final application deadline. So let's talk about a few other pieces before I, you know, send you back over to Elise. So transcripts need to be official. So that means that they need to come directly from your school to nursing cast. We can't accept, you know, transcripts that you walked over to your school, picked them up yourself, and then are trying to drop them off at our office. That unfortunately doesn't work. You know, letters of evaluation. Um, again, we require three of those letters, and one of them does have to be from a current nurse manager or supervisor. Um, experience hours, it's not so much an experience hours, we're calculating them based off of the month, and we're looking at full-time employment for those. And then we're gonna talk about essay questions too, a little bit later on. 
So again, all of those transcripts do need to be submitted directly to nursing CAS. And people get hung up on this because they'll say, oh, well, I took this class when I was in high school and I transferred it into where I got my bachelor's degree. So I don't need to submit a transcript for that. It's like, no, you do need to submit a transcript. So, you know, even if you only took a single course, make sure you are submitting your transcripts for every secondary education institution that you have attended. So where do I send these transcripts? This is the primary address where, you, where you'll send them to. Uh, some schools participate in electronic options for sending. There should be a nursing CAS address directly linked through your application portal when you're trying to send that if you're doing it electronically. But if you need to send paper copies, this is the best address to send them to. So the three letters of reference, again, one needs to come from your nursing supervisor or manager who can really speak to, you know, what your skill set is and what the experiences that you're having on a day-to-day -day basis are. Uh, and then we always recommend that, you know, when you're thinking about letters of who's going to submit additional letters for you, you really want to pick the people that are going to be your biggest cheerleaders, like outside of, you know, mom, dad, family, friends, whoever, like who is really going to go to bat for you? So think about that, you know, whether it be maybe someone that you shadowed, maybe it's, you know, someone else on your unit that you work particularly close with. Maybe it is, you know, a volunteer opportunity that you participate in, you know, extremely regularly. You know, we're really just looking for someone who can really speak to your skills, your abilities, and be that hype person for you. Next slide, Elise. Thank you. Um, so for the experience hours, again, we're not calculating them by hours. We're really calculating them by month. Um, that minimum 18 months experience is very crucial. So, you know, for anyone who's currently working in a critical care setting, you know, that first six months, you're really not necessarily flying solo. So it's really, we, the program wants applicants to have a really solid full year of being able to practice and being able to practice and be confident in their skills before they start thinking about this as a field. Um, all of your experiences must be completed prior to application submission. So that means that if you are at 17 months in September and you're like, oh, well, I'll be, I'll have more than 18 months before the deadline, don't submit until you've got the 18 months because then you're just phased out of the application review. And I hate to do that to people. So if you're not at 18 months or more, don't submit your application until you're at 18 months or more. And then all experience hours that are eligible to be considered need to be completed in the United States. We can't accept, you know, experiences that were done abroad, whether even if that's in Canada or Mexico, you know, we really can't accept those experiences. And that comes down to the licensing piece of the program. So all experience hours to be counted need to be completed within the US. So there's a couple of different prompts that you'll have on the application. And these are really just the essay prompts that we want you to answer. There's a whole bunch of other questions on the application, but they're all primarily yes or no and you know, short, very, very short answer type questions. So I'm not going to cover those two in depth. Um, I always like to remind applicants that there is a COVID-19 impact essay. And that gives you an opportunity to really reflect on any educational, personal, professional challenges, opportunities that you may have had related to the pandemic. So, you know, I always advise people try to use that as an extra spot to, you know, make people excited about you, especially where, you know, if you're out in the nursing field, you have been rocked by this for the last several years. So I know that you've all got, you know, different experiences with COVID and, you know, use that opportunity to really express whatever it was that, you know, is leading you here. Um, we do have three specific UNE essays. So, you know, the first one is just, what are the factors that led to your interest in the field of nurse anesthesia? And we're really just looking to, you know, gauge your interest. Like, what was it? Like, is it, you know, 
you find the whole process of anesthesia interesting? Was it an experience that maybe you had, you know, yourself? What what is that? And we're looking for that. Um, you know, what are the most significant factors in your decision to apply to UNE? You know, that's obviously we want to know what is it about our program that really speaks to you? What is it that, you know, is it the faculty, is it the staff, is it the simulation center, is it the fact that the first two semesters are hybrid? Whatever that is, we want to have some ideas about that and what you are, what you think our program is. And then the last one is new for this cycle. Um, it's the first year that we're asking this outside of interviews and it is explain how you deal with stress. What are your coping mechanisms? And how will your current stress management techniques assist you in being successful in our program? I will tell you that this is a very stressful program. It is a high stress, um, it's a high stress, a high stress position out in the career world. So, you know, having some of these ideas is really helpful for us when we are interviewing, when, you know, if you are accepted into the program in you know, just getting to know you a little bit better. So we're really trying to do that a little bit more right off the bat instead of waiting until you're already here or you're sitting in an interview and asking me these questions. So once you've submitted your application, first off, do a happy dance because like that's a big deal. <laughs> and, you know, the, la the next piece is making sure that you are keeping track of your progress within nursing cast. So if you forgot to submit a transcript because you took one of those classes at a community college and it transferred into your undergrad, you know, your bachelor's level institution, and you just totally put it out of sight, out of mind, they're not going to reach out to you. They are going to put your application on hold. I will never receive it. Our office will never receive it, which means the department will never receive it. So you need to be the ones responsible for following up with nursing CAS on, you know, is my application on hold? Do they have all of the materials that they need? Um, reach out to them. So the other piece is back to that verified status. So if, you know, if you don't know if your application is verified, check with nursing cast. For the most part, it's going to be fairly clear. There's going to be a bunch of like green circles and verified check marks and things like that. But if you've got questions about it, nursing cast is definitely going to be your best reference and point of contact for that. Um, once we've received your verified application, we're going to reach out to you. We're going to say that we've received it. You know, we're going to try and give you as much information as we can as it becomes available, whether that be that, you know, you have missing or incomplete items, whether it be that, you know, okay, your application is complete and now we are waiting to invite for interview or whatever it is. We try to communicate as much as we can as it becomes available. That being said, if you haven't heard from us in a little while, don't stress out about it too much, especially especially this early in the cycle, um, you know, while the application is open and we are accepting applications, we're just now starting to plan interviews for the spring. We're just starting to think about these things. So, you know, even if you've got a completed app, stuff isn't finalized yet and the application cycle is open for quite a while longer. So don't stress out too, too much about it. That's kind of the best advice that I can say for that one. <laughs> So completed applications, what does that mean? What does, what does that even look like for you, Annie? So we consider an application complete when we've got our, you know, all of our documentation. So, you know, all of your transcripts are in, we've got proof that your biochemistry course is completed. We have, you know, a valid, we've got your valid and up-to-date, you know, PALS, ACLS, nursing license, your three letters of recommendation, all of that stuff needs to be on file and completely verified. And that's when your application is finally complete. Once it's actually complete, we will tell you that it's complete. And that's where kind of people get a little antsy because that's where usually people have to sit for a little while until we get a little bit closer to interviews. And until we get kind of into that new year, that's unfortunately just where people sit with it. And we do communicate through you, uh, nursing cast pretty regularly. Uh, so make sure that when you, you know, if you change your email address, if you change your mailing address, make sure that you're updating that in nursing CAS because that's how we're going to get a hold of you. So interviews. People always ask, what do I need to prepare myself for? What are the interviews like? 
you know, interviews are a required part of this process and are conducted by invitation only. So, you know, our office is going to reach out to you if you're going to be invited for an interview. We usually try to reach out, you know, at least I like to do, you know, three to four weeks. Once I know that we've got interview dates scheduled, I try to start inviting to interview as quick as possible because you're all working busy and working professionals. You know, the more time you have to know about these types of things, the better. Um, our interviews are going to be virtual again over the, over this cycle. They are going to be done over Zoom again this cycle. Uh, like I said, we're working on finalizing the plans for what that will look like. Um, there are going to be some changes compared to the last several years. Um, so once those are made available, we'll try to communicate those out to people. But right now, we're just still in the process of finalizing those. All right, I think that's, we're gonna give Laura a moment to take a breath and uh, have a drink of water. That was some really helpful information and our presentation's coming to um, an end very quickly and then we'll go into a nice Q&A discussion. But I do want to just share some upcoming opportunities, you know, as Laura was sharing a part of the application um that you'll have to answer is why UNE's program and we want to provide you the opportunity to learn about our program certainly before answering that you can of course use our website and um, connect with us but we have um, some on-campus events scheduled in September actually September October and November some are available on uh, your personalized UNE page so since you registered for tonight's event you all have a personalized UNE page that will um, contain some information about the program, our community, but also opportunities to connect with us. So um, in September, we have a on-campus open house that our DNP program will be a part of, our faculty, current students. So that's going to be a great opportunity if you can come to campus. Um, that day again is September 16th, which is available um, on your personalized page, we do have um, student-led tours happening, and we're working on um, some virtual opportunities. Like at the beginning of the presentation I mentioned, you know, we want to always make sure that we can meet you where you're at, too. So um, we'll most likely have something scheduled in October and then maybe towards the end of the fall, too. So we want to provide you ample opportunities to get to know UNE's program. Um, our community and really get that face-to-face um, -face contact with the program as well. So uh, when we send this event recording out, um, you also might get a separate event invitation for our open houses um, and other campus visits this fall. So just keep your eye out and, you know, join us for when you're available, but we'd love to welcome you to our Portland campus. So last piece just some contact information. Uh, this is our general um, admissions email. So you're welcome to connect with us here. And then it's always routed to the appropriate person. Um, and this grad.une.edu link is just another path into that personalized page. So it's a form link. And as soon as you enter your email, the form recognizes you in the system. So you'll get in there. But in our prior communications, um, you may have received your personalized URL, I would recommend bookmarking that just so you have easy access. But we want you to stay in touch and reach out with any questions. And we're here to help you throughout the entire process, the cycle and for future cycles. So we want to thank you. And I think now we can stop sharing and let's dive into some questions. Um, so we have some questions that were received through our registration form. Um, again, the Q&A feature is available and open, so please feel free to ask your questions there. And I think, um, Laura, I want to start off with just some questions with that we've placed in some categories. Um, so as we're going, if you have a follow-up or want us to clarify something, please feel free to use that. And we do have some links that I didn't share during the presentation because I think it's helpful to talk through some of them. So um, before going into talking about coursework, I think the most important that um, I want you to kind of emphasize again is our deadline. Yes, our application is open. You have time to submit. You heard a little bit of, about uh, a little bit from Laura about 
the process of getting your application from, you know, to verified and then some of our review process. But can you just emphasize what verified means and clarify how long a verification process could take? Because I think that's important when we're looking at a final app deadline that is based off the application being verified. So yeah, so verification process can take anywhere from, you know, a day to several weeks. Yeah. It really depends on how quickly you have all of your materials in there. So that means that all of your transcripts need to be submitted, you know. So if you're missing a transcript, it might be weeks until you realize that you forgot to send something or until you realize, well, why haven't they contacted me yet? And mm -hmm. you, know, you really need to be careful with that piece um, because they will not send you their, our, your application. Yeah, as we heard. Yeah, as um, it, you know, you need to be sort of on top of connecting and touching base with nursing cast. But what were you going to say, Laura? Um, so the other piece is just, you know, that applicant because that verification timeline can be so different you know you don't want to wait until february 15th to submit your application because yeah. you know it might be verified the next day but it might not be verified for several more weeks and at that point we could be done interviewing or you might you know while you submitted your application you know we didn't get it so we can't consider it and we've already mm -hmm. kind of filled the class or moved along or whatever that is Mm -hmm. So I do encourage applicants to, you know, while you don't need to submit right now because we won't be interviewing until the spring, um, we also just like don't wait until the last minute is kind of yeah, the there's a fine, there's a perfect moment in there. It's not maybe you can start working on your application. And if you um, want to submit now, you know, great. But also don't rush, you know, as we heard, and we'll talk a little bit more, um, you know, if you're still completing your experience hours and you're not up to that minimum 18 months, don't submit. But don't wait until, you know, a couple of days before the final application deadline to submit your application because it's um, it may be submitted, but not get verified by that point of February 15th. And I think that's just something really important to clarify because it can be. Uh, misunderstood. Yeah. So, and I mean, we do have a priority deadline for this cycle. So just like last cycle, we, you know, did a dry run of a priority deadline. So this year, our priority deadline is January 15th of 2024. Um, and we are planning to push back interviews right now. The discussion is to start doing interviews that last week in January. So, you know, that is, a you know, from the last couple of years, it is a very large shift. The first year that we were doing admissions for the DMP program, you know, we were doing interviews in mid-April and people got decisions in late April. You know, we felt like that was too late. So we pushed it back mm -hmm. even further. You know, last year we were done interviewing I believe the last date we interviewed was like March 23rd. And then we had interviews out the following, mm -hmm. you know, within a couple of days after that. So, you know, you really want to try to get things in earlier, especially if right now the conversation is starting to interview the last week of uh, January. So, you know, there's not going to be a whole lot of time after that February 15th final deadline that we'll be interviewing at, yep. at the current schedule. So this is just all food for thought, but we're trying to be certainly clear mm -hmm. in this timeline and our recommendations of, you know, preparing your application now, working on that. But just again, don't wait to submit. And if you mm -hmm. have more questions, we can certainly discuss this further. Yeah. So, and I'm going to answer a couple of these questions that are in the chat yeah. just because they're relevant as well. You know, mm -hmm. we, you know, we accept applications rolling, we look at them on a rolling basis, but those dis final decisions are not given until we are done interviewing for the cycle, which is why, you know, I'm really putting such a large emphasis on not waiting until the February 15th final date to submit your materials. Um, just because, you know, we aren't going to be interviewing that late or we're going to be interviewing past February 15th, but we're going to, you know, yes. until the end of March, you know, it might be the first week of March that we're 
doing our last round of interviews. So, you know, to give people decisions in mid-March, it, like I said, we're still working on finagling that, figuring all of that out and finagling mm-hmm. some dates, but, you know, this is just something for you to be aware of. We don't do, you know, we don't do an early decision deadline. So even if you have your stuff in by that January 15th prior deadline, we're still not giving you a decision earlier, but you get to interview earlier. Potentially could be reviewed and invited to interview earlier. So yes. So you answer the questions about um, the rolling it, um, admission, somebody asked, and it was a great question, how many students do you accept into the program? Because I don't think we've actually even shared yeah, that. Number. So, so we, have a, we have space for about 22 to 25 students in any given year. And that is solely based upon the number of clinical sites that we offer. Um, and then the number of just, you know, rotations that they have to offer. It really is, comes down to the clinical sites you know, our students are graduating from this program with, you know, more than enough hours in every single one of the different areas of anesthesia that they have to have practice in. Um, You know, we fully believe that we want you to be competent and confident in a whole bunch of different areas. And, you know, we don't want to give you, we don't want to put our badge of approval and sign, you know, sign the deal without believing that, A, you can do this, And B, that, you know, you're going to come out of this with a whole heck of a lot more experience than what the minimum requirements are. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, thank you, Laura. There is another question in the chat that I think we're going to come back to regarding the curriculum and the program being front loaded. But we want to get through just a couple more admissions related questions. So let's just talk a little bit about coursework. I think you clarified a lot, but just to reiterate. UNE's prerequisites are biochemistry, correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, So we don't require any other specific classes, you know, outside of you need to have that nursing degree and, you know, you need to have at least a bachelor's degree. It's really that biochemistry piece. And again, that is because it is not being put into the DMP curriculum. So that was a decision that was made way, 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 way before my time, you know, this was a decision that was made back when the master's program was still up and running. So it's really, you know, it's a, there's a big emphasis on needing to have this stuff done and, you know, in a timely fashion. So we know that um, biochemistry can't be completed at the community college level. Where can students take biochemistry and is it acceptable if it's an online course? Oh yeah, no, most, I would say, the vast majority of applicants, that biochemistry course is done online. Like it is very, very rare. I would say maybe out of the 25 students that are matriculating, maybe two or three of them have done it on an actual brick and mortar on campus location. So it is very rare for students coming into the program and applicants to have taken biochemistry at a, you know, in-class setting. Most of them that we see, honestly, the probably the most popular class that I see is the UNE Chem 1005 course, medical biochemistry. Uh, It's a asynchronous course. You are given a maximum of 16 weeks to complete complete it, but it is fully self-paced. So you do it kind of Mm -hmm. within your time frame. So a lot of students really like that. A lot of applicants seem to really like that. There's a few others that are out there that I see a lot of, but the UNE one is definitely the biggest one. The next one is probably um, UC San Diego Extension does a biochemistry course. Um, it's like 43057. Um, it's just you know all the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird thing to remember. Um, yeah. But that's kind of the other, you know, most common course that I see. Other than that, it's kind of all over the place. Like I said, you know, we can't, we don't accept community course, call, we don't accept community college credits. Uh, don't waste your time doing it through Portage Learning. It is not a high enough level. It will not be accepted. Um, you would need to retake it. Um, so just kind of keep those things in mind. And Laura, I shared in the chat um, a link to the uh, UNE Online Science Prerequisites. Mm-hmm. So 
um, the course offerings will be listed there for online courses. And then I also shared our um, biochemistry equivalency form. Awesome. Uh, but um, yeah. that I can talk a little bit about that form if you want. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So we do a biochemistry prerequisite equivalency form. And that's just a fancy way of saying put in your biochemistry course if you think you've completed one uh, that meets our criteria. And I will write back to you and say, yes, no, I, maybe I need some more information, whatever that answer is. That way you have, you know, we can get you a concrete answer usually. So I like to tell people five to seven business days. It's usually within the next day <laughs> that I'm giving you an answer. You know, if I'm in the office, I'm answering those, you know, Monday through Friday. So don't, you know, if you submit it on a Friday afternoon at like 445. I will get to you probably on Monday, but otherwise I'm um, pretty good about getting back to you the next day. And that's just a, um, an easy thing to check, just to make sure that the course you've taken meets the requirements. So feel free to grab that link. And um, yeah. what I will do is share it in um, alongside the event recording. Um, one last question regarding coursework, and then let's switch to another topic. Um, so, we know that the course needs is uh, needs to be completed by the final application deadline. What about students who are planning on taking the course, maybe the UNE online course this week, um, this that takes 16 weeks or less, you know, um, should those students wait to submit their application or how can they move that application forward alongside yeah. that course being completed? Yeah, so if you're if you're planning it out and you're like, I will have this done by the time, you know, yeah. the final application deadline rolls around, make sure that you're putting that as a planned or in progress course as a part of your application. Um, that just clues us in that, oh, you've got this, you know that you're, you have to have this done. And what happens then is we just put your application on hold once that final grade comes in. You know, if you've done it through UNE online, you just send me an email and say, hey, I finished the course. And then I can pull in the backside and pull that course information and the final grade for you. No need to send your transcript, no need to kind of do additional steps that way. If you've taken it elsewhere, I need the final transcripts. They need to be official. Um, so just kind of keep those things in mind. Just mm -hmm. if you're planning it, if you've got it in progress, again, it needs to be completed by the final application deadline. Final grade needs to be posted by that date. Um, and then making sure that you have it listed as planned or in progress. But it might not be a reason to not get the rest of the application ready Correct. and submitted and verified yeah. with that, you know, clearly indicated that I have this planned and in progress and knowing yep. that by February 15th, it will be added in there. Yeah. Just and trying really to also what we're doing is, you know, if we see yeah. that it's planned or in progress, you know, we are going through and we are checking off every other box in the background. So then we are just waiting on that biochemistry piece. Yep. You know, we are making sure that your letters of recommendation are there. We are making sure that your experience, your resume, everything that we need is up to date and good to go. So that when that biochemistry score is in, you just are automatically moved kind of over into the department review side of things. And um, a great question related but not on um regarding the coursework but other licenser licenses mm -hmm. and certificates um for instance pals does that need to be completed before the application is submitted so it needs to be completed no later than the final application deadline i will tell you that you need to make very clear that you are taking it which means in that place of uploading a certificate, you want to upload your confirmation email saying, oh, that's a good idea. Your confirmation yeah. email image saying that you are taking it. Otherwise, it will just be a, sorry, you don't meet our requirements. And, mm -hmm. you know, thank you very much for submitting your materials. And then you come back and say, well, I'm doing this. Here's my proof. Skip that step, upload your confirmation email. <laughs> yeah, that's a really <laughs> kind good of my best recommendation for that one. Yeah. And then um, once it's complete, up, uploaded or how would they you know uh, if if it's in progress and it's planned um then usually i i'm pretty good about tracking these things i have a whole lot, list of dates kind of embedded into the system and it will automatically reach out to you to say hey 
you know, you should have this by now. Where is this? I need okay. this. You say it nicer than that? No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Obviously, it's much more nice and it's much more formal than that, but it is a, you know, it is one of those things. It it goes yeah. into that completing an application. If I don't have that, your application is put on hold and it's not considered complete. So yeah. I need something to, you know, continue to justify holding on to you. And we're only playing. Laura and I work very closely together and she will bend over backwards to help applicants, but it really does come down to like, it's black or white. You know, you either have yeah. it or you don't. And this is a way to show that you have a plan and that confirmation, you know, really is proof, you know, yeah. too, alongside We're looking, that. you know, think of it as like the responsibility piece, right? Like we are looking for people who can go into practice and be responsible and, mm -hmm. you know, communicate well. Those are two very important things out in the medical field. And I'm sure all of you, you know, can identify people that are really great at communicating and really great at following through and people that are not great at either of those things. So we want mm -hmm. to see that ability to communicate and follow through. Totally. And it makes our jobs a little bit easier too. It makes it a so, lot easier. <laughs> um, actually along the same lines, but this is now talking about experience hours. How would you like proof of critical care experience, excuse me, submitted proof of shadowing? How do you want that so it is very much a, you know, for the shadowing, it is literally a yes or no question. And we are asking, you know, you know, how many times did you shadow? And, you know, what, you know, it's a very, very like simple question. It is not, it, you know, we don't require signed affidavits like other schools do where it's, you know, I yeah. need you to sign off on my permission slip saying that I, you know, that I shadowed you in this type of a procedure. We're it, it is a yes or a no, and it's like how many times and how many hours have you shadowed? It is just okay. an estimate, it is not anything formal. Um, for the experiences piece, we're really looking at those resumes. Um, the other piece that I always like to tell applicants is that if you think that there are pieces that I am going to have questions about, also include it in that experiences section. Um, that's a really great way to give some additional details or some additional background information. You know, it gets into a lot more niche pieces like, oh, how many hours a week did you work? And what, you know, it just gets into a lot more of that like niche details that maybe you wouldn't have on your traditional resume. So that's a really great spot that if you are looking to give additional information outside of a general resume, that's a great spot to do it. Okay. Awesome. Um, so we only have a few more minutes left. I want to get to a handful of questions that were submitted in the registration, but um, I do see some in the Q&A that we're going to do our best to to get to. So just hang with us. One quick one, is the GRE required? It is not required. Okay, so no. We do not have any testing requirements um, in the future. They are thinking about implementing the CASPER, but that has not been finalized or decided upon and it would not be in place for this application cycle. Okay. Um, a question about um, TOEFL, is that required? So that is required for individuals whose lang primary language is not English. Um, and Elise, I think you have the link for the yes, I do. language page. Um, so, you know, if you, for an example, you know, did your studies at an English speaking Canadian institution, we're not going to require you to do the TOEFL. You know, if you did your, um, in, if you did your education in China and it was done in Chinese, then we're going to need a little more information there. Um, mm -hmm. So think of it that way. There should be a listing on that page about what is required um, as far as the TOEFL or the IELTS. Uh, we accept both of those for graduate admissions. The other thing that should be in that page is a listing of all of the different countries that we do not require a TOEFL or the IELTS test for. Um, and that's because they're, you know, if you can make a good case for it, we'll listen to it. Um, so that's very helpful, Laura, thank you. Um, quick question about, um, is there any preference given to students from Maine, outside of Maine, and how does the admissions committee view students who are outside of? Yeah, so we take students from all over the U.S. You know, this incoming class that starts in a couple of weeks 
You know, yeah. there's someone coming in from Hawaii. There's someone coming in from Washington state. There's other people coming in from California. You know, obviously we're in New England. So there's a good chunk of people coming in from New England, but we really do take people from kind of all over the U.S. Awesome. That's good to know. And a good question just to clarify. Yeah. Um, we have a question about uh, letters of reference. Um, so in terms of um, letters of recommendation, if you feel you have a few people who would write equally strong letters, is there a preference of the type of recommender you'd like to see? For example, a charge RN, a shadowed CRNA, mid-level provider from an ICU floor, et cetera. What are your thoughts, Laura? Yeah, so those are all really great sources for you to get letters of recommendation from. We really want someone who can speak to your clinical abilities, you know, your practicing abilities. That's, you know, if they can be, you know, if they can be your hype person, let them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a question about, if you have a gap in your ICU experience, do you count mm -hmm. overall ICU experience or recent ICU experience? So we count overall ICU experience. So we understand that people have lives and mm -hmm. that this is a field that is very challenging and it's, you know, it's got its rewards, but it can also be very challenging and we are very respectful of that. So, you know, we're calculating it as a total. Okay. That's a great question and very good to know as well. Um, so I just want to um, take a look at our Q&A as well as our chat, just to see if we can just quickly, and if you're comfortable, uh, Laura, um, switching over to talking a little bit about uh, clinicals, because we have some interests. Sure. Um, so, um, well, we're probably looking at the same question, but this <laughs> one's about, um, you know, you understand the program is front loaded. Can you speak to when simulations start and clinicals begin? Yeah. Um, so for this program, those first two semesters are hybrid. That's summer semester of your, it's technically your second year. It's really that first summer semester. Yeah. Um, that is where you come to campus and you start right off the bat in the Sim Center. So in that first week in March, we have our students come in, they do a little bit of a tour, they do some just very generalized practice orientation in the Sim Center, but starting that summer is really when they're utilizing the Sim Center on a very regular basis. And then they stay in the Sim, you know, they will continue to practice both in class and in the Sim Center for that summer semester and for that fall semester and then clinicals start the spring that second spring semester that second first spring first. semester so reminder you're starting in the fall and your first your first fall and your first spring is hybrid mm -hmm. that the summer is when you transition to campus you'll go summer and fall on campus and then spring is out on clinicals right laura yep that's the start of clinicals great um, so, um, can you also shed a little bit of light on the CRNA only sites and what that might mean? Does that mean we not, there's a non-compete with medical students? That's Any exactly what that, that's a, exactly what it means. So it means that, um, it's a, typically those are smaller sites and it's CRNA kind of leading that, um, it's you know, there's not going to be the MDs, DOs that are going to maybe be overseeing things at other sites. It's really going to be like the CRNA is the one calling all of the shots and doing all of the steps and parts and pieces. Okay, great. And two last questions. I know we have a minute left, so I want to get <laughs> to one, just a general sense about where clinicals are. Are they in Portland and other cities? And then I want to answer a question or ask a question about some resources for students. Sure. So that's where we'll end. Yeah, so our clinicals are kind of all over New England. Um, typically we tell students that you might need to be licensed in up to three states. Uh, they're working on trying to get that to be only one or two. Um, we've, like I said earlier, we have sites kind of all over New England, all over the Northeast, and obviously, you know, all over Maine. Um, so, you know, it's really about trying to figure out like what you need as a student, like what kind of practice do you need to have? What kind of specialties do you need more experience in or do you want to have more experiences in? Um, and then just what works for you and for your life and for your schedule. You know, 
obviously it would be great if everyone could be at main med and that was the only place they ever need to be right it, but that's not how it all works that is you know that is a common rotation for students to have but it is not the only rotation for students to have and again we will have some um future events like our on-campus open house as well as virtual opportunities and I think online you can see a list of some of our sites as well but um, these are other great times to um, understand further what the process looks like and how do students just manage all of this and that leads into a final question which is a really wonderful question um, the program we know is is stressful um, rewarding but challenging like Laura had mentioned, what resources do um, UNE and the program have in place to support students? An example was counseling. Uh, we do have yep. a, a counseling center on campus. Yeah, we've got a fully de dedicated um, counseling center for our graduate students. We also have a fully dedicated tutoring center for our students. Um, the program, you know, your academic advisor is kind of in constant contact with you. They are faculty members within the program. So they kind of have a constant eye on you. You're constantly yep. having conversations with them about what your needs are, where you're at, what's happening. You know, I'm really, you know, is it that you're really stressed out about an exam and you need someone to just kind of talk you down off the ledge of like deep breath, you know more than you think you do? Or is it like an interpersonal conflict that maybe you need some assistance navigating? Um, a lot of the students, so I was just talking with the new program head this afternoon at lunch, and she was telling me how all of the students have started doing, like, going to the pool all together and Aww. doing, like, free swim together, and it's, like, become just a thing that happens every once That's in a nice. while down on our Bitterford campus. Um, I will also say that they are really Historically, there's been a group of them that have always been into doing like all of the intramural sports and those activities. So there's always, you know, there's always a volleyball club. There's always, you know, there's a group of them that are obsessed with pickleball right now and basketball. So there, there's always, they're always trying to find something fun to do to relieve some of that stress, as well as, you know, making good use of the resources that they have on campus and the resources that they have within the program. Yeah, an open door policy, I think, in all of those areas, just to, um, you know, build a community, at, and, you know, get the support that you need. And like Laura said, working with an advisor who can um, really support you early as you are going through the program. Oh, and one last question. We'll get this in there. And I, I appreciate people hanging <laughs> on. We know it's past seven o'clock, but this is a good one. Who do we address the letters of reference to? Yeah, so those letters of recommendation do need to go directly to nursing cast from your letter writers. And there is a process embedded in there. So, you know, what you'll do is you'll put in your letter writers information and their email address. They'll go in, they'll fill out some additional information. There's a Likert scale that they'll fill out for, I think it's like 10 or 12 different qualities that they think you may, you know, possess or on a range, obviously Likert scale. Um, and then they'll have an opportunity to upload a document of their choosing. So that's where they would upload that letter. And Laura, that was some helpful information. What I took from this question, and maybe I'm, um, who, uh, maybe I'm looking at it really surface, <laughs> but should they say to whom it may concern? To you know, who oh, yeah. are they addressing the letters or UNE's Office of Graduate Admissions or UNE's DMP program? That's <laughs> what I was taking from that question. So, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for that addressing piece, I would say you know, say to the admissions committee or to the you know nurse anesthesia faculty, what something along those yeah. lines. I will tell you that every year someone you know, write something about, oh, yes, I'm writing you this letter of recommendation for this very specific other school. And then we're like, oh, well, okay, now you're applying there too. So like, are you actually serious about us? Or and it, that's a, uh, an easy catch or easy mistake, but an yes. easy thing to not do as well. Yeah. So, you know, same thing in an essay that always somehow yeah. worms its way in there. And it's like, oh, okay. Like, that's great. Like you obviously, you know, chances are you are going to apply to more than one school. There's, you know, there's a bunch of them out there, but it also doesn't leave a great taste in your mouth if you're seeing that that's what you're doing, that you're trying to write sweet 
notes to other people. Yeah, yeah it reminds me, you know, if you're on a date and someone calls you another name, you don't yeah. really want to hear that. So, you know, on that note, I think it is time to end the event just because uh, we know that everyone has to get back to their life. We hope that this was helpful and informative and just walks you through what we're looking for in some of these really important pieces and, and applying. And um, we're certainly at the point now where you have the information and you can just sit on it, take it in and see, you know, what your next steps are. But please don't hesitate to reach out to um, our office for any questions. And we hope that we can connect with you either in person or again, virtually for you to learn more about our DNP program and why it might be a right fit for you. Anything else, Laura? I think that's about it. You know, like I, Elise said earlier, we are, you know, we've got some upcoming tours that are led by our students in the program. We've got yeah. our upcoming open house on September 16th. So I know I will be there. I believe Elise, you will also be there. So we hope to see you all <laughs> soon. Very nice. Thank you, Laura, for your information. Hope everyone has a good night. Have a good night, Laura. Thanks. Bye.